move on for comments. And please feel free to interrupt. I, I tend to talk fast and whiz through the slides, but if, if I'm not giving you a chance to ask questions, interrupt me, please. Nobody has anything at the moment? Okay, so let's move on. Um, I told you about the importance of an isolated sample for coherent refractive imaging. And the next several examples all use that, that criterion. Um, I didn't tell you about 3D and how we do CDI with 3D. But if you think about it, it's just an analog, although it's not the same as tomography. If we find a way to measure sample, I should say measure in reciprocal space, diffraction space, over as much of the reciprocal space of that sample as possible, it's a volt sphere, in three dimensions, not just two dimensions with some angle, but by rotating the object, we might have some hope of recovering to high resolution, remember, according to the depth of field expression earlier, the full three-dimensional structure of the object. So in a actual measurement, a kind of cartoon of that avault sphere, or the part of it that we measure, will look like this uh, piece of a shell, a segment of the spherical shell that we measure out to some maximum momentum transfer or numerical aperture in the optic sense. The bigger that is, the finer the resolution that we can hope to reconstruct. So if we rotate the sample, we're mapping out now many such pieces of shells. And we can fill in that Fourier space, or reciprocal sphere, with information that we can then hope to recover the phase of to get the, the structure of the object. So this was demonstrated actually quite a while ago by Henry Chapman collaborators um, some do dozen years. They took a, a simple test object. Uh, which consisted of this pyramid on a silicon nitride membrane. Uh, silicon nitride is relatively transparent to even soft x-rays. It's maybe 50 or 70 nanometers thick in this case. And it was decorated, or I should say the, the edges and the corner of this pyramid were decorated with 50 nanometer gold balls, gold spheres. So the idea is what then that they took this guy and made a uh, coherent diffraction pattern for many orientations of this object and rotated it through as much of 180 degrees as they could. I forget how many projections? Oh, it mentions here, 123 projections covering this angular range, 57, minus 57 to 66 degrees. At some point, the edges of the window were getting in the way, the support membrane, and they couldn't go to higher angular range, which, have give, which would have given them better depth resolution or a longitudinal resolution. But here are some images from that. So you see now just the dead-on projection here. Um, I think this is a movie that won't play. But this is a volumetric reconstruction from that 3D data set, which allowed you to look at the object now from any angle, not with ideally resolved, but in three dimensions. Or you could even zoom in and see the features of um, the gold balls on one of these edges of the silicon nitride pyramid. So I should have told you, this is a scanning electron micrograph as a reference to make sure the method is working. These are all the recovered or images from the recovered data here. So it works. People have gone quite a bit further. These are chromosomes from a bean plant. I think a Vishifaba bean plant. Um, the idea is very similar. You take this, coherent, this bean, which you select the coherent part with a pinhole. You can clean up. That beam, the scattering from the pinhole with some edges called guard slits, is just to make a very nice, clean illumination on the sample without structure from the edges of the pinhole. Then put your sample in the beam, measure the coherent diffraction pattern. There's one feature I should mention of this experiment and the previous one, which may have been uh, a bit not obvious, and that is the center of this diffraction pattern measured very near key equals zero, or no scattering angle, is very bright, and most detectors can't handle that. So it's blocked. There's a beam stop, a little square of something dense like lead to block the center. That makes recovery of the low spatial frequencies or the low resolution information about the sample a bit difficult. And people have done some tricks like short exposures and no beam stop combined with long exposures and a big beam stop to try to patch those together. Um, the signal falls off very quickly with momentum transfer Q or numerical aperture if you like and can be very bright in the center. Anyway, these are reconstructions of this particular object. Um, you can rotate the 
data around and a fully three-dimensional volumetric set was taken. What was, uh, I guess, noteworthy especially about this was not only the fact that it was 3D in a biological object, is that it survived being dosed in the beam for quite a while. Um, the method methodology has been extended to other samples. Here's some work by John Miao's group at UCLA. Um, these are uh, simulated mantle, Earth's mantle samples, which are iron and sulf sulfate rich. Uh, the idea was to map the olivine distribution as well as, as iron in these things. You can take slices through the volumetric reconstruction and see all the details here and plot the iron density quite quantitatively in this case. So that was all near the small angle, some would call it small angle CDI, of a fairly disordered or almost maybe totally non-crystalline object. All the same rules apply, the, the numerical aperture or momentum transfer out, out, out to which you measure determines the resolution that you can reconstruct. But if you remember the blue and yellow slides from earlier, the crystal case, we should be able to get all that information now from a Bragg spot from a single crystal in the beam. So here's the idea. We have our X-ray beam, some coherence finding, finding apertures before the sample, and then we put maybe a lens to focus onto the sample or mirror. And then on, our, on a diffractometer, we can place our sample through which we can rotate to define the Bragg condition and measure the Bragg spot and the light around that Bragg spot, the fringes or most importantly the speckles around that Bragg spot due to structure in the, the crystal sample um, at a given reciprocal lattice vector. So typically this step is actually rather tricky. How do you get the beam and the focus to put a lot of light onto a very tiny sample? Um, and then even trickier, you have to rock that sample to establish the Bragg condition. Once you do that, you can collect many measurements through the uh, Bragg peak and use that information to do phase retrieval to solve the problem. So this is a very nice review article here by Robinson and Harder from 2009 in Nature Materials. It gives lots of details and uh, a few hints of what I'll come to next. So this is a picture of what the pattern would look like if you could measure it in 3D. And in fact, when you rock it through a relatively narrow angular range, just a half a degree or a degree of the sample angle in the beam, you're actually tiling a huge swath of reciprocal space. This is great. This actually gives you now access to depth information that you had to fight a lot harder for in the small angular case, small angle case. Or before we had to rotate the sample or the beam around the sample through nearly 180 degrees to get to high depth resolution. If you remember this case of the hot dog shaped resolution element penetrating the sample and trying to define depth resolution by going through large angles. Here in reciprocal space we have this wonderful benefit that just a small angular range swings the beam tremendously through reciprocal space. So we can now map out by just rocking literally the sample through pretty tiny angles the 3D and take that information, put it together and get the 3D or three-dimensional speckled ball, some call it. Um, I was really struck by the sculpture out in front. I don't know if that was intentional, but it looks pretty much like one of these. If I'd had time, I would have put the photo in, but um, do you know the, does anyone know the origin of that? It's a star on it. But. So this is of a, you can pretty much guess from the sample, it's a cubic crystal. It's real data. It's a silver nanocube, about three or 400 nanometers on a side. And it makes from its facets these beautiful fringes with quite coherent light focused onto it. Um, OK, so the three-dimensional pattern is the Fourier transform of the three-dimensional electron density in the sample by just measuring through a small angular range rocking the sample. Here's a reconstruction, actually the diffraction data with the full rocking curve shown in this repeating loop and a 3D reconstruction of a gold nanocube or nano, nano object. It's a crystal but it's not quite a cube. And you see here now all kinds of detail uh, shown in this isosurface or false surface rendering of the magnitude of the reconstruction. The phases aren't shown here. We do have that phase information though. So that's available to us and that can tell us additional things. Um, one other point here, we're assuming the object is inside a support or a maximum size constraint for the problem to solve the phase by these iterative methods we talked about before the break. 
shown by this box here. It was a parallel pipe bed, not a complete cube, because uh, we could sort of make it thin on one side, and that actually gave us a good reconstruction. So in practice, you can start with a large guess of this finite support and kind of shrink it down. There's a nice little algorithm called shrink wrap to do that and make sure you still get a good reconstruction. If you go too far, it doesn't work, so you know to back off and then you're probably done. So you don't really need to know the object is of exactly a certain size but no larger than some maximum in practice. Okay, so what else do you get from this? And this is unique to the Bragg case. Remember that this lattice, the atomic lattice, with electron density around every atomic nucleus, gives rise, because of its spacing, to Bragg spots in reciprocal space. But if that lattice constant or distance between the atoms changes a little bit, clearly it's going to shift the, the Bragg spot. What if it's changing a little bit within the sample? In other words, if you squeeze the sample along one direction, a uniaxial strain, now in maybe this direction, the Bragg spot doesn't move, if you could measure along that axis. But in this axis, because you squeezed it, it would move. And in particular, if there's a gradient in that, you might have some information about the strain. So it turns out that's true. If you consider our 3D crystal lattice, we have the incident wave and the scattered wave, k final here. Um, within an area that's strained, in fact, it's going to shift part of the spot relative to the part that's not strained or strained differently. So that gives rise to asymmetries in the Bragg spot. Instead of being like you saw in the uh, picture here, now maybe it's brighter on one side than on the other or, or vice versa. So that's rather nice. This method can tell you about local atomic or lattice strain within a sample. Um, here's a, a beautiful example that really put this method on the map um, by Robinson and, and Mark Pfeiffer in 2006. So they had, this is a scanning electron micrograph of some lead uh, droplets which were de-wetted by heating and then annealing of a lead film on a silicon substrate. Um, the dimension I think is barely visible here, but they're about half a micron in size. Here are the diffraction patterns, the reconstruction were done, was done. And now here are reconstructions showing you not only the shape of the object within it, but recovered from the phase of the object, the lattice displacement corresponding to the strain. We're not seeing the strain directly, but how much of the lattice has moved because of strain between the droplet and the silicon substrate. And in fact, it worked out quite interestingly that there was a, a two-point or two-pole structure to the strain that made it look as if it had a, a bimodal distribution here just from the substrate on which this droplet stuck. So it was a bit of luck for the sample that it was interesting, but it allowed us, allowed them to see the strain within this otherwise nearly perfect single crystal. So this method has been developed quite a bit further. Uh, this is more recent work. Um, showing a strain between the core and the shell in a zeolite. This is a highly porous aluminosilicate network that had been coated with a carbon, an organic material. And you bake it, and all these strains develop here now. So this is the phase of the reconstruction showing equivalent to strain, its lattice displacement directly in false color. What happens to these objects as uh, a single crystal, actually, as you cook it at different temperatures up to 450 C. Nice thing about x-rays is uh, you can have uh, windows on a cell. The, the x-rays go right through particular hard x-rays. And you can do these in situ measurements as this particular sample is cooked actually to 550 C. Um, here's what the setup for this kind of experiment looks like. This is a view almost down the beam of the diffractometer at beamline 34 IDC. Ross Harder operates this uh, in, in at the time, in Ian Robinson's group, they built this from University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and now it's being run by Advanced Photon Source in Chicago. Beam comes from the lower right. The sample is in here, sorry, right about here. And then on an arm of the diffractometer is just is the detector, a CCD camera or a pixel ray detector that measures the diffracted signal. So to give you an idea of scale, um, this arm is, the detector here is about one meter from the sample. It can be extended to almost three meters. If you were to measure around multiple Bragg vectors, 
Now you can get, let's say, 1, 1, minus 1, 0, 2, 0, and minus 1, plus 1, plus 1. Now you have information about, in this particular case of a gold crystal, the strain along several different real space vectors as well. That's rather nice. You can then build up a strain tensor and learn about the three-dimensional strain in your sample. But it takes at least three or more reflections. And that can be challenging because you have to rotate and find the reflections, ideally with the same crystal, not losing it in the beam and so on. So here is an application of that. This is a, a pillar of zinc oxide, or a nano rod, and uh, using six different measurements actually, the calculation of the full strain tensor was devised, which shows now in false color, here's a, uh, actually lattice displacement again by Marcus Newton and collaborators. The strain in this pillar, in particular you notice this recurrent theme of it's much more um, compressively strained in the dark blue at the base of the pillar where it was stuck onto the substrate. That's just how it grew. Okay, um, without going to too much detail, it's also possible to extract from the phase information, the phase signal that you recover from the sample, information about other features such as dislocations, missing atoms, or other defects in the crystal. These particular uh, lithium ion battery cell crystals, uh, this is actually data from the earlier slide I showed before, where you saw this speckle pattern increasing as the battery was charged and the particles got smaller. Um, but what's recovered in these images here are dislocations in a network, a chain of dislocations corresponding to defects in the crystal. We think this is where the lithium was going in these particular guys, during charge or discharge, lithium going out. Um, but this method allows you to uniquely see not the dislocations themselves, but the strain field around them, which allows you to pinpoint them quite accurately much finer than you could see features in the sample actually by just interpolating in the center of each local strain field. Okay, um, I gave a hint about this earlier too. You may remember if we were to put some curved or other phase structure on the curvature or other phase structure on the beam, that can be a constraint for solving the phase problem. So this method was first suggested by Keith Nugent and collaborators. Um, Oh gee, 15 or more years ago. The idea is you start with your plane wave, you focus it down onto the sample, and let's put the sample not quite in the focus where the, the light or the beam would be quite parallel, but a little out of focus. So there's a curvature drawn by this arc here on the sample. So this wave is diverging in this particular case through the sample. If you know the lens you've got, and you know its focusing properties, you now have a very good idea about the phase the phase of the wavefront that you put on your sample, and that's a constraint you can use to solve the problem. Um, this is a, a simulation, but it works very well in practice, of a test object, the letter CXS, and a comparison using curved beam and plane wave reconstruction showing you steps along the iterative phase retrieval process. I think the, uh, maybe the movie won't play. Yep. So, I'm only showing you about every 100 steps of many thousands of iterations. A little hard to see here. But if we start with just the first few iterations and then let it play, you see the curved wave guy gets an answer really quickly within a few tens of iterations. The plane wave case does get there, it's just much slower. So having a strong constraint in this case of the curvature on the incident wave really helps. This became known as, as Fresnel coherent diffractive imaging because you're working in the Fresnel regime of the sample uh, where you have a lot of curvature of the waves. It's no longer the far field or Fraunhofer case. And in particular, it allows you to solve this problem of, in fact, eliminate the problem of having to have an isolated sample. You know it so well now, the beam defines the edges of the sample. You can look at a subregion inside an otherwise extended sample. So this fuse-based structure was, is a, a couple of different man-made fuses in a test integrated circuit made by IBM Corporation. Um, the dimension here is two microns. This guy is intact, showing you an intact metal fuse 
And these are copper wires with tungsten connections inside of a silicon dioxide matrix. And this one has been blown out by, blown out by running high current through it over some time and cooking it in the oven. So IBM cared about where does the copper go and how did it blow and is there any residual damage around these points where it blew, um, much like a failure of probably the transistors in my laptop a few years from now. So these images here show what you can do to map this fuse um, and the, the, the tungsten studs and the tantalum liner around it by stepping the focus beam through this otherwise extended sample. So we've just removed the requirement for an extended sample by putting a very strong constraint on the problem, the curvature of the wave. Uh, there's another way you can do this. In question, yes. The more the better, but what we found is if you simply have a good idea of what your lens is, what you use, or it could be some mirrors, what optics you use to focus, that's enough. If you can measure what you put on your sample, that's the best. Um, sometimes it's, uh, you only need to measure once and then you can use the same illumination every time because that hopefully doesn't change. But in practice, even knowing how the optics are made is, is good enough. Yeah, good question. Okay, so this is quite nice. Um, this is a complex slide. I just want to draw your attention to this picture here, mostly, or maybe the one on the top right. But there's another way you can enforce a very strong constraint on the diffraction measurement to avoid having an isolated sample and still get a reconstruction solved for the phase. If you take a series of spots and scan them on your sample. Let's say you move the sample along in the beam or the beam on the sample and let's further require them to overlap by at least half the spot size. Every diffraction pattern that we record, coherent diffraction pattern, will contain some information from the preceding one and the next one. So there's a lot of redundancy now in the information. If in addition we know exactly where we put those spots, we kept track of the relative positions the sample and the object, we have an additional constraint. So now we know a great deal about where that information was collected in some region of an a sample that we've scanned with our beam. So there's this algorithm here and a method called tychography, which means to fold. It was originally developed for electron microscopy to fold the images from the Greek, where if you apply this somewhat complicated looking algorithm here, where you define a probe, and in the beginning, hopefully you know the probe, but you don't have to know the probe, and then some object, O, and measure a series of diffraction patterns, psi sub n, at different positions, Rj, which correspond to the product of the probe times the sample. We're aiming our beam, the yellow spots, through the sample. And measure all those diffraction patterns, put the information in about the relative positions, the algorithm requires taking some Fourier transforms and inverse Fourier transforms for each position, indicated here by the red and blue lines. But you can do all this in the computer very quickly. It's pretty easy to code up. It takes about 20 lines or 30 lines of code with MATLAB or something like that. And then you can then run this iterative reconstruction algorithm for the collection of diffraction patterns and recover the sample structure. The beauty of this is you can not only see a subregion within an extended sample, you don't have to measure the whole sample. If you remember the sampling or oversampling requirements means having a very fine pixelated detector far away. You've avoided that problem, but you also get a reconstruction of the probe itself. So it tells you about the beam on your sample. And it works very fast. Tens of iterations instead of maybe hundreds instead of tens of thousands. So there was a lot of work leading up to this. Here are some of the references. Pierre Thibault did probably the most seminal work and really put it on the map uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, but this method now for scanning systems is really taking off and many people are using it. I will just point out this. If you're using an ultra-fast laser and you're putting a whole ton of photons on the sample, 
This may not work because you might not survive more than a few shots or even one shot. But if you can study the sample without blowing it up in the first shot, then this is a great technique to use. So it's been put to use um, in several different applications. This is energy resolved tachography, this uh, iron phosphate nanoplate. Um, the whole plate here is about 300 nanometers on a side. In particular, they showed the iron density in this by tuning around the iron L edge at 710 EV. Um, it can be combined with the fluorescence measurements. So you have not only the local carbon mass, for example, of this algae particle, this algae cell, but also uh, elements like potassium, sulfur, phosphorus, and so on from the fluorescence. And that's rather powerful using these coherent diffractive imaging methods combined with fluorescence. You can also tune around a resonance in a magnetic system, analogous to the lithography experiment now, but we'll do it in the scanning fashion. Same type of sample, these worm domains in a, in this case, a gadolinium iron sample, but similar to the cobalt platinum from before. Measure your series of speckle patterns and then reconstruct them. In fact, you can do it, for example, as a function of magnetic field and plot magnetic domains or reconstruct the magnetic domains in the sample as you change the magnetic field. Further, you can extend this to the Bragg case. So now let's go to a Bragg reflection from a crystalline sample. Apply the same kinds of algorithm. You have to be a little bit careful now how you do it. Um, in particular, you have to be careful to stay on the Bragg condition. So going to 3D is quite hard, but there, there are some advances. And this has been used to map, for example, polarization stripes in lead titanate to quite high resolution, a few nanometers. Um, this, these stripes develop from a slight shift of the lead atom in this titanate structure, which spontaneously goes up or down and results in these nanometer scale stripes, which are quite difficult to see by other methods. Or if you work at a really large Bragg angle, you have some information when you penetrate into and back out of the object, which gives you in 3D some structure here. So this particular device was another system made by IBM. It has this polysilicon gate electrode on silicon, on silicon on oxide. You scan along here with your tachographic measuring setup. And that allows you to plot now the strain field not only because we're using Bragg diffraction in the transverse direction by going through a large angle into and back out of the sample the longitudinal direction. It's not very high resolution in the depth case, but it, it is some. Okay, last section is about ultrafast things. Um, I think we should go at least through some of that. Um, anyone need to stand up or shake it off? Okay, it's been a long day. So the, the real attraction of using a very short pulse beam is to outrun radiation damage. Uh, radiation damage time scales and let's say biological cells are milliseconds down to tens of femtoseconds. The smaller the object, the faster the scale typically. But a lot of simulations have shown and now measurements have shown if you want to do the measurement before the sample is destroyed, particularly at high resolution where you need a lot of flux in the sample, you have to go fast. So this seminal work by Richard Neutze estimated for just a single crystal, in fact, how fast you would need to go. And the number is in the femtosecond time scale. So that's, that's the hope. That's the dream that you might be able to measure the structure of a single particle, even a single um, protein crystal, even though you've destroyed it with one measurement. And from that diffraction measurement, reconstruct not only the phase, but the full structure of the object. So this corresponds to this diffract or diffraction before destruction concept, that you get the signal out just before the sample is you know, a plasma ghost of what it was before. Um, and very elaborate methods have been developed to inject particles one at a time into the coherent X-ray beam from a, a laser like LCLS here. Um, and then measure the diffraction signal onto a, a, a large detector that allows to measure to very high momentum transfer angle and thus high resolution. Um, it's become really the holy grail. In fact, some have argued it's, it's the basis for LCLS. I think there are many more good bases. And not only that, but the European X-ray free electron laser 
uh, project in Hamburg to be able to reconstruct uh, maybe not even crystalline single molecules, but non-crystalline single molecules. There's no crystallinity requirement by the methodology, although it does get harder as you work near small angles. So here's a picture of the coherent X-ray imaging station at LCLS, a cartoon, I should say. Uh, the beam comes from the left. There's some focusing mirrors and slits and so on. The sample is in a chamber here, a detector at the back of that. Um, here's a, a photo of that setup, I guess, looking upstream. So the sample chamber is down at this end. And this, you've seen it, it's big. Um, it was already some six or seven years ago now, but Marvin Siebert and company showed you could use this methodology to image a single Mimi virus. It's a pretty big virus, a couple hundred nanometers on a side uh, with this cute icosahedral structure and get some pretty low resolution images. These are using long wavelength soft x-rays relatively, but something corresponding to the shape at least of, of the particle. Maybe not so much detail about the internal structure. Uh, you can push this along the direction of crystallography using CDI methodology for small isolated samples on a fixed target, step the target along, do the crystallography that way. I think you've heard about this. Using phase retrieval methods, you can refine this information that you wouldn't have access to otherwise. Um, this has been done to solve, for example, the structure of a 2D crystal, bacteria rhodopsin. Um, I think the paper is out, but I don't have the reference here. But I'd like to come back to holography just briefly because it's, it's so powerful and so quickly gives you the phase. Imagine if you had, again, some object as a scatter, but you put in another object, and let's call that the reference. Maybe you had a pretty good idea what that reference scatterer was. Um, and let's make it small, small compared to the object. It could be forward or backward of the object in, in the longitudinal sense. But the two guys being coherently illuminated together will produce two waves that then can interfere and form holographic fringes, which if you know something about your object, you've characterized it already for the reference scatterer. You can learn about the unknown object and from its reference or its object wave. So these are reconstruct, I should say, simulated diffraction patterns of these three cases. This is work by Tice Gork over here at Slack. The idea is that you would use some small xenon particles as reference objects and maybe another xenon particle or something else as your object. So the model system looks something like this. These clusters are nearly round, which is rather nice. They make beautiful airy-like patterns with round fringes. Um, and xenon has many electrons, so it scatters quite well. It becomes a good, bright reference source. The setup looks something like this. Again, the coherent beam is coming in. The clusters are injected and also some unknown particles, maybe a bioparticle protein or something like that is also injected. So cartoon-like, that's the sketch. And Tice has been developing this with a couple powerhouse groups between Janusz Haidu and Henry Chapman um, in uh, Uppsala and Hamburg both. Um, the idea is then you've now got a way, if you can allow these two guys to be in the beam at the same time, to make holograms, which you can then reconstruct quite quickly from the objects. So here's a comparison of the earlier work by Marvin Siebert using just CDI, no holography, without holography, and using this holographic method of the same kinds of icosahedral particles. And you can see it does a better job. It's not perfect, um, but uh, it's already quite good. And this is recent work, just published. Tice has gone a little further, and knowing some information about the actual size and shape of these xenon Reference scatterers has improved the resolution further. Um, I'll leave it to the paper to, or you to the paper to read about it. Okay, um, I think we're running out of time. I would love to tell you about pump probe methods and how you can use CDI with some kind of pumping system like a, an ultra fast optical laser, which might change the state or introduce lattice vibrations, phonons within a sample, and then you can probe them after a programmable time delay and understand really about the dynamics in your sample using the ultra-fast X-ray beam as the probe now. But uh, you'll get a copy of the slides and you have the talk and uh, 
the next sort of seven slides are about that. So I think I'll just move ahead um, and leave you with these examples to read about. Maybe the movie is worth looking at. This is another zinc oxide uh, pillar where we've now measured dynamically what happens as you shock this with a laser and then probe it over a series of time intervals, delay intervals, from the incident probe to look at how this guy moves. Why do you care? Turns out zinc oxide is rather interesting. It's piezoelectric. Uh, people are exploring whether or not you might be able to make energy harvesters from these guys. And the modes that they vibrate at um, can tell you a lot about whether, that some modes can tell you about whether or not they're good at energy harvesting or not so good at energy harvesting. If you can tune them, that would be great. Okay, I think let's just skip to uh, the last quiz. This is the real test of how awake everyone is. We have one minute. So what will not be imaged in a pump probe experiment? And you don't have to see the, the, the examples that I just blew through. Just remember what we talked about with electron density and strain and uh, lattice vibrations. And choose your votes. Got answers all over the map again. And some very shy people at the back here. Another green, own size. No takers? Nobody really willing to, to risk it? I guess you're all risking it. The answer is none of the above. It was a trick question. <laughs> so sorry. You'll get a handle on all these things. And that's really quite nice. So the take home message is, an ultra-fast x-ray source like LCLS combined with CDI methods and some other way to time it with like a pump laser. It could be a pump electric field or some other thing to change your sample. allows you to make movies, time-resolved movies of how the sample responds dynamically to that pump. This is quite powerful. Okay, last slide uh, just before closing. You heard about these huge, expensive, multi- hundred million dollar to billion dollar sources like LCLS and synchrotrons and so on. I just want to remind you, and this is work done from a dozen years ago now, almost a dozen years ago, that while X-ray field electron lasers are quite amazing, you can actually do coherent, ultra fast coherent refractive imaging on a tabletop. Um, these are quite soft X-ray or even so-called extreme ultraviolet. The wavelengths are tens of nanometers, not sub nanometer. And there's some other limitations to that. Um, but they run it now down to at a second time scales and they fit in a small room on a big tabletop. Okay, um, I think let's leave it at that, um, but I'll be happy to answer questions. And uh, I'd like to thank, most importantly, the many people that contributed slides to this presentation, particularly Ian Robinson, Garth Williams, Ross Harder, uh, Matthew Cherakara, and Tice Korkover here at Slack. So thank you. It could mean, um, I think the community is finding that tychography now is taking over. You have to have a good quality scanning system. You really need to know where you, the relative positions of your beam and your sample. Um, but you don't need to know very much at all about the illumination, per uh, your question earlier, on the sample. In fact, you can get that information out of the measurement if, if you know everything else well. So you would think the single view method would be most powerful, maybe for free electron lasers, in particular the Fresnel CDI case. But most people have moved toward tychography these days. Of the wave, yeah, even if you know the optics well and so on. The other nice thing about tychography I should mention, or forgot to mention, is there's no limit to the size, just time, of the sample you can cover. 
So in principle, you can scan. I guess that's true for now also, but it's more complicated to keep everything stable. So that depends on meeting your sampling criteria. If it's the uh, isolated sample case, remember the bigger the sample, the smaller the lag spots, and the finer you have to measure them to meet this twice brag spot or better sampling criterion over sampling approach. So how big can it be? In practice, a few micron size sample, a one angstrom beam, a 12 keV beam, and uh, Three meters are kind of necessary to do the job. You can plug the numbers. If you make the sample tens of microns, you're now going out to 30 meters, or you have to increase the wavelength, which is not always not so good either. So that's kind of a ball, ballpark answer to, to your question. Um, there are good reasons for wanting to be able to use tychography or one of these other methods for larger samples or at least subregions, maybe you don't want to connect all the dots, but you'd like to measure here, here, here. You choose regions of interest in your sample. In that case, isolated sample requirements are going to hurt you. Are there questions? Hmm. The better the scatterer, the better. So biological objects are very interesting, but they tend to be made of very light elements, and they don't scatter strongly. There are not many electrons to contribute to the diffraction pattern. So it's really a matter of choice. It's what, what do you want to study. Um, you saw a lot of gold and heavy things, xenon clusters and so on, which have tons of atoms that scatter well. So they become choice test objects for getting the methods to work and, and really making sure we understand what's going on. But the interesting problems tend to not always be so easy. Yeah, that's true. If you could label, for example, your sample, like immunogold staining of some gold or silver or something onto proteins of interest in a biological sample, maybe you don't need to blast it so hard and still get all the inter interesting information out of it about where certain proteins lie within the sample. True. One more. Um, so I have a bunch of tachography data sets that they get from any data. <laughs> It's a very low signal. So we got decent signal, but the drag patterns are just completely smeared all over the thing. Ooh. Ooh. Well, the biggest challenge with Bragg tachography is, is staying on the, the Bragg peak. Yeah. Or if you want to do 3D, rocking it and not having the particle or your target, the region you care about, swing through some huge, you know, eccentric motion. But if it's just that the Bragg peaks are blurred. There's some tricks involving multimodal approaches where you can model this as an incoherent system consisting of weighted modes, 5, 10, 20 modes. And that's pretty good. It's equivalent to, to looking at blurred Bragg peaks or a system that moved and it blurred the measurement, uh, as well as partial coherence. So that might be one approach. Thanks.